Welcome back to another episode of Christian Natural Health. Today, I am very pleased to have uh, Ed Welsh with us. Ed is a Master's of Divinity and a PhD, and he is a licensed psychologist and faculty member at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation. Ed has been counseling for over 40 years and has written numerous books on the topics of depression, fear, and addictions. Most recently, he was a major contributor to the new Life Council Bible from Holman Bibles and New Growth Press. Welcome, Ed. Thanks for joining us. Lauren, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how biblical counseling is different from secular counseling. Is there a difference? I would hope so. I would hope so because, <laughs> yeah. because scripture, what does scripture do? It, it Scripture opens our eyes to things that we wouldn't understand on our own. So in a sense, secular counseling is, is careful, thoughtful counsel but it doesn't have access to the things we can't see very well. Uh, right. Hopefully Christian or biblical counseling or pastoral counseling or pastoral care is, it, it, it is, well, it, it, it moves us to the one who says he holds the entire world together. Uh, so you know, secular counseling has hope for, for this age. It can re it can alleviate symptoms many times. Uh, hopefully, what what the scripture allows us to do is understand how do we live life fully. And you know, John says abundantly. How do we live life abundantly now, but abundant life that has eternal implications? And when you especially when you think about things like depression, the challenge with depression is there's a certain realism to depression where depression says, why, do, why does anything matter? Why, why bother doing anything? Because ultimately death erases our resumes and, and everything else. Well, what, what counseling does, it uses scripture as its base. It, it gives us a different kind of meaning for life. Does that make sense, Lauren? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious, like from a nitty gritty standpoint, for those who are doing secular counseling versus biblical counseling, how do they practically look different? Like, what is it that you're doing that's different? Is it just that you're, you're going into scripture or more talk therapy versus, you know, counseling in terms of here's my recommendations based on God's word or, or, or help me, help me fill in the blanks there. That's a great question. Uh, I, I hope it does. I, I hope if you, if you took a sort of a 10 minute swath of counseling, you would notice it was Christian. Let me think real concretely, a person I saw this morning, uh, for example, um, what would be different? I, I will pray when we're done. Uh, try to say, okay, what's happened here? And what do we need that only Jesus can give us? So I'll do that. Uh, even though I didn't do it this morning, it's not unusual for me to, for somebody to say something so difficult that uh, I said, can I pray for you now? <laughs> Let's, what you're saying, this cry from your soul is so important. Let me speak this to the Lord with you and, and ask for his help. So hopefully you'd see something like that. That would be very concrete. I think another thing you have seen this morning is, is simply the question, what is it? What is it that God says to you that is good right now? And that's not a test. It's not um, on the third grade teacher saying, How, you know, what's two plus two? It's, it's let's consider this together. <laughs> you know, what you laid out is, is a very hard situation. It's complex, multi-layered. Um, what is it that God says to you now? <laughs> let's consider that particular question. Let's let's wrestle with that question. Those are the, so those are some of the things you might find different. Yeah, and it sounds like the implication there is that you expect God to answer. Like you're going to be quiet together and actually hear from a third party, the big <laughs> third party in that counseling session as opposed to just the one-on-one -on -one and just what you know, like you're opening yourself up to outside wisdom. Yeah, and, and there are different variations on that. Uh, there is a simplicity with which God speaks. So so if if the complexity of the situation doesn't, it doesn't, we can't crack that nut very well. What we're going to find is, all right, today, what do we do? We there are new mercies this morning. I'm just taking from Lamentations 3. We know that he has new more mercies for you this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to trust him for today. 
And what does it mean in simplicity to, to what are the things in front of us that he has called us to do? There's all kinds of things we can't do anything with. What has he called us to do today? So that might be, be one of the more specific questions, what does God say? But there are other variations to the theme where it's not that unusual for us to say, we don't have a clue what God says. We honestly don't have a clue. Uh, but instead of being disappointed by that, it becomes it becomes this wonderful opportunity. Let's pray. Let's pray together and, and let's talk to other people this week and let's come back and here's the situation. What is it that God says? And if we come back the next week and we still don't have any answers, what do we do? We we pray, we, we uh, for, for myself, I would talk to friends and say, here's the situation, help me think about this. What's, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we work on this together? The, the nature of scripture is not so much that you have to have all this dramatic insight and have to be smart, have to be a Bible scholar. The, in some ways, yeah, we're called to have wisdom as we help one another, but wisdom is really, it really is founded on a humility before the Lord. And a humility says, well, hey, there's a lot of things we don't know, and we are part of this larger body of Christ, and, and the Spirit of God is pleased to use many different people in our lives. Absolutely. That makes sense. So, and distinguish for me that interaction from pastoral care. How is this approach separate from like a, a Christian seeking counseling versus a Christian seeking pastoral care? Can you set the teeth? Yeah. yeah, let me, let me demystify counseling a little bit okay. because I, even though technically I'm a counselor or a psychologist, I, I don't, I don't use that particular word. Um, I, if you ask me what I did, I, I'm not quite sure what I would say. I used to have a friend who, who would call me a rent-a-friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could never decide if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> but uh. I decided it was a better thing than a worse thing. Um, the, the Fundamentally, what we're saying is that as human beings, it is created in us to need help. Yeah. That we are that we are not capable of going it alone. That all wisdom does not rely in us. And and in this world, you will have trouble, and and you will have a lot of it. Um, and it will drive you to extremes. Um, we need help. That's in some ways that's the most human thing that we could possibly do. To think of ourselves as some sort of independent practitioners, I can manage my life. That. That is ultimately something, something that's really very dangerous. But to say we need help, um, we need help from the Lord, and we need help, we need help from people. That's, that's the beginning of wisdom. So, so let's take counseling, which we tend to think of as very professional, and let's move it into everyday life. Now, I'm, you know, this morning I, and throughout the day, I've been working on some projects. So I haven't had that many conversations, um, but but typically at the end of a day, I'm able to look back on my day and and realize there were so many places where I looked to my wife for help, and it wasn't simply uh, my wife is a better mechanic than I am. So how do I fix this? It's not it's not just those kinds of things. It's it's just places where you know, you know sweetie, would you pray for me today? Here's Here's a place I it's I'm stuck here. I I I feel like I'm let, let me think of an example. Um well I'm I'm anxious about whatever it might be. Would you pray for me? I just feel like I'm spinning my wheels and I'm out in the future and I'm I'm sort of missing what's in the present. Sometimes it will be, sweetie, I'm distracted. Here we have we're having an important conversation and I'm distracted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Would you pray for me? That's that's sort of normal life. Um, what's counseling? Counseling's just an extension of normal life where where what is it? It's there's a regularity in which we are seeking help. Most of my the help that I receive now, it tends to be. Uh, ad hoc. It tends to be it, it tends to be as sort of the situation arises. And I'll go to my wife. I'll talk to a friend. I'll talk to a colleague. Um, uh, it's. <laughs> I suspect I've even talked to people on an airplane seat next to me before. <laughs> so if I'm really desperate, if I'm really desperate, I'll just help somebody. Help somebody. Right. Help. Uh, but counseling, we tend to think of counseling as help. 
where there's an agreement. We're going to, this is an important matter. We're going to meet regularly um, and we're going to keep going after this until, until we see something good uh, that, that comes in and some kind of change that we both think is important. So you see what I'm doing. I'm trying to demystify counseling and say it is just another form of help in the same way that pastoral care is a form of help in the same way that that when we're in a small group with other people right. it's a form of help um when we go to church and hear participate in worship and hear a sermon it's it's a kind of counsel if you will people don't know us as well in that situation but it's all different versions different mediums if you will venues for yeah. for seeking help which is a really good thing to do that's awesome. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking about the fact that in my area, uh, naturopathic medicine, the idea that strikes me over and over again is every time I study an herb or I study a medicinal spice or I study a food the way God made it, what blows my mind is that every single one of them is anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. Uh, a lot of them are anti-cancer. Most of them are antimicrobial. They're all chock full of all kinds of nutrients. It's almost like he wants us to be healthy. And uh, like he's trying to come up with ways. At, he's, he's got so many different avenues to get help to us. And he just wants us to latch onto the one that helps, that, that, that is available and the one that we resonate with. But he wants to provide what we need. He's a good father. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And he does it body and soul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. So what are some of the issues that you often see for that people come to you for counseling in? What are some areas where biblical counseling can be helpful? I mean, what, what isn't, but I suppose, yeah, give me some, some rough ideas. The kind of we, I've been around for a little while. And so when you've been around for a while, you, you don't have to be a historian who studies history. You can just sort of live it out and you, you watch it unfold. So there's no question that I've seen, I've seen, significant changes in, in our culture and the kind of problems or the sheer amount of problems. So there's no question that I've seen that over the decades. But but um, I think when I consider what, what are the things that I tend to see, they are the things that you saw in the 1980s, in the 1950s, in the 1750s, and you've seen it throughout the history of humanity. Um, you find the effects of broken relationships. You, you find the effects of, of wickedness, wicked words and wicked deeds against us. You find the experience of rejection, um, uh, rejection in, in a sense where you feel as though you're on the outs before God and before other people. Uh, certainly people are talking about anxiety now in the way that they haven't before. And is that simply because they now have permission, authorization to talk about it? They have words to talk about it? Or is it increased? I suspect it's both. Um, what do I find? I find people who, uh, they, they talk about anxiety, but now they talk about panic attacks in ways 50 years ago, you, you, you could not find someone who had a panic attack. Right. Now, you, you, now it's hard to find somebody who hasn't had a panic attack. Um, and I'll include myself in, in that group. Um, um, uh, this morning, I, I mentioned I was just talking to some folks this morning. Um, this, this sort of this um, sort of obsessive and compulsive style that can accompany somebody's anxiety as a way to try to get control in in their world. Um, a person I talked to this morning was was a person who found himself obsessing about physical problems in his life and it was growing and growing and growing he didn't have any significant ones but he found himself thinking about death thinking about decline thinking about there's something going on i have to find out what it is what is it it's anxiety it's very recognizable anxiety but it's taken a very physical kind of form um, i find i find the problems at root that we encounter today are the ones that have appeared all through history. And obviously, they're all, since they've appeared all through history and they're common to humanity, you find scripture addressing them. They're, they're on God's heart for us as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that just reminds me as you're talking about things that have changed. Um, I see headlines all the time now about the suicide rates that are skyrocketing. So are you seeing a lot more depression than you used to that's the, for, in the people that are coming to you or what kind of trends are you seeing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing people who, you know, that, that there are different kinds of depression. There's some kinds of depression. I think it's just plain old physical. It's, you know, the person's circumstances haven't changed. There's nothing different in their life, but all of a sudden it's as if the world literally has gone from color to grays. Um, uh, it's literally gone from feeling enthusiasm one day and feeling numb the, the next. So, so I think there, that's, that is sort of the classic depression. Uh, and I don't know if that has necessarily increased as much, but I, I, I certainly continue to see that. I think what you find now are, are people who, who are in depressive situations and overwhelming situations, and it's their body reacting to it. No, 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 we are talking about anxiety a little bit. Um, I, I do suspect for some of the depression we experience right now, it's, it's a world that seems out of control to a person. There's too many things. There's too many relationships. There's too many, there's too many nasty comments. There's you know, too many people to please. And there's too many decisions to make about your future. So it, it, it begins with anxiety and anxiety. It feels like you're stirred up. It's, you know, your mind is racing. And I think sometimes it's almost as if depression is anxiety that is given up. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I that there's there's nothing I can do about this, and and why bother doing anything? Um, so so certainly I do see. I think anxiety that it's it has worn itself out and it's looking like depression. Yeah, there's this. I, I don't remember what the study was. It made me so sad when I heard it. But because you know they'd never do this these days because of you know animal rights and whatever. But the story of a an eel that was put there's a piece of glass eels over here foods over here on the other side and he kept trying to get at it trying to get at it trying to get at it and eventually he realized he wasn't going to and he gave up they took the glass away and he died of hunger because mm -hmm. he didn't have the, the the hope anymore to continue to go out and seek that so my question for you is from a biblical counseling standpoint where God's word has the answer to all of these things, but a lot of us can hear it and it'll feel like it just doesn't sink in. We can be like, yeah, 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 I know. What strategies do you have to help it to get from here to here to actually sink down into the heart? Yeah, well, sometimes we don't know what the words are though. <laughs> For right. the words to go from our head to our heart, it's 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 a challenging book. It's It's about an ancient Near East culture. It's yeah, you know, how many times have I read Galatians and it talks about circumcision? <laughs> I think for years I was saying, "Well, what is that? I don't even know what it is." And everybody's making a big sure. deal out of it. And, and and when I began to understand those things a little bit more clearly, I said, "Well, still, why why couldn't Paul have written something that was more timely for all of us?" Uh, in, in other words, Scripture is it's you know, there are two features to Scripture. What was God saying? to them in that particular context, which is hard enough. But now the question is, now understanding how God works then, how does that, what does that say for what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling right now? The, 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 my kids showing disrespect, those kinds of things. Um, it's, it really is a very, I think a very challenging process to, to draw out of scripture the sort of, in a, in a way that it shapes us specifically for modern struggles. So I think that's, I think you're, you're identifying, I think, two things. One is, once we know it, how does it become part of us? But, but I think really the significant challenge is, is how, can, how can scripture speak in a way that is accessible? And it shouldn't be too mysterious. It's, it should be available to children. Um, how can it, how can we hear it in a way that's accessible and it's deep it's hopeful <laughs> yes this is this is what i need and also not in a way where it's going to be some sort of magic treatment uh, i suspect one of the challenges with with your work is 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 people would prefer to have a kind of pill that the next day things are going to be better but yeah. But you're, what you, the, the kind of work you do is really very similar to what I do, where it's, 
it's it's a endurance it's an endurance in the right direction and you watch change sort of sort of emerge gradually in that context that's that's the way the lord is pleased to have his world run uh, it's just how things are built we grow gradually everything happens gradually and there's something right about that for, for our souls because otherwise we'd say lord help oh good now I, now I feel better i don't everything's fine and off i go i can have my own independent life but who wants that um it's the one of the challenges in life is how do we wake up and say jesus help me and then the next day say the same thing and the next day say the same thing that's that pleases god and and it tends to be the way he works so, and you identified the idea of how do you distill all of the information in scripture and apply it to our modern culture and our, our personal situations. And that's kind of what you did as far as the articles that you wrote for the Life Council Bible, you're trying to take that information and bring it into the modern day so that people can apply it. Give us a little bit of like some of the topics you talk about and maybe give us a deep dive into one of them. Okay. Uh, now, I, I didn't write all the topics. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I, otherwise, I wouldn't encourage people to get it. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, not that I'm demeaning my own work, but but when you're when you're trying to deal with just this broad group of human struggles, to have various voices, I think, is a real benefit, um, and it's the way it should be. So, I think there are 150 short articles that are interspersed at appropriate times throughout this particular Bible. And I suspect there are probably around 30 to 50 authors or so who are behind those, which, again, that, that, that really makes it strong. It, it, it moves from arguments with our kids. Um, uh, uh, there might even be an article on what happens when I don't like my kids anymore. I, I can remember <laughs> the first time I can remember the first time I ever heard that it was why my, my my i had two daughters and why they were very young and when they're very young how could you ever how could somebody ever say they don't like their children these precious little things are the sweetest things in the entire universe um uh well i guess it's the same way you could say what happens when you don't like your spouse who would have thought those things would have happened so it has sort of that every day what do you do when how do you love someone when you don't love someone or how do you love someone when you don't like someone on one hand, on the other hand, you have things that that don't seem as though scripture would speak, such as bipolar disorder, um, which which is uh, which is I think is most prominently a physical and brain phenomenon. But but what we want to do is show the depth of scripture, but also show here's its breadth. That doesn't mean it's going to solve every problem, but it is going to give us inroads into those problems. That grant us hope in the midst of them and also not only grant us hope but give us the opportunities where well there's a passage in scripture second corinthians 4 the, even if the outer person is wasting away the inner person can be renewed day by day um, so it moves into some of the more psychiatric kind of problems as well and, and all kinds of things in between mm -hmm. So, and some of the things that might be relevant too, I see that you had one article in there that was on like, let's say eating disorders. What does scripture have to say about that? Uh, we were just talking about Galatians a little while ago and, and how Galatians is, is, sometimes it feels inscrutable. Like it's, it was good for them, but but not for now. The, the heart of Galatians, I'm, I'm going to choose the anorectic part of eating disorders um, rather than the more bulimic overeating. Uh, and I realize they can go together. Um, uh, the, the scripture never uses the word anorexia. And that, that's, the, that's the challenge for us. You can't look it up in a concordance and all of a sudden there are the five verses for it. Um, but we do believe that the scripture, the word of Christ speaks to our hearts in all kinds of different challenges that we can have. Um, in anorexia, one of the one of the challenges is people use the word control. You want to have some kind of control over your world, and you can't, and you can't. So you you narrow your world more and more. So you try to have absolute control over over your own body, which 
which obviously when we're doing things that are beyond what God has called us to, things are going to go a bit haywire. But, but, but the question I think oftentimes for anorexia is I, how can I have control in and of myself where God is not part of it? Because I don't want to trust anyone else. I don't, I don't, I don't want to trust a human being, and I don't want to trust God himself. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential for me to have some sort of control over my body. And oftentimes, it's control over my own feelings. Um, uh, how can I somehow kill these feelings that I have? So, so I think the first thing is, is, is that we are brought into this completely different world where it's not about how we perform and how much we have control over things. It's, it's trusting another one who has control. So what does that do? It, it's frightening to a person with an eating disorder, but it's also appealing because they know they can't, they, they know their control isn't working. And what does it mean to enter into this world where you don't have to somehow be perfect? You don't have to, in fact, the way into this world is you acknowledge that you're not, that you acknowledge that you acknowledge that you are this thoroughgoing mess. So what is that? It's it's a kind of door for somebody who is struggling with control and and, and anorexic anorectic sort of behaviors. Once in that door, what do we do? We we invite the person to speak, which sometimes is very difficult for them to do. But inviting them to speak, we're not just being nice. We are trying to to we're trying to say this is how life works in God's house where I think I'm thinking of the Psalms right now and the Psalms have an implicit question behind every one of them where the Lord says to us tell me what's on your heart he, he says even though I know your heart I know you better than you know yourself it is important for me for you to say it so find words and I'll even help you find words and that's what the Psalms are oftentimes. Here, is it like this? Is it like this? Does it feel like this? Does it feel like you're sinking? Does it feel like you're, on, you're right hovering over death itself? Um, uh, speak to me. And here's the requirement. Say anything you want. But, but here's what I want. Say those things that are most important to you. Speak about your fears. You, you know, all the, oh, so many Psalms talk about fears. Talk about your despair. Talk about, talk about those times when you feel like I have forsaken you. Talk about those things that are on your heart, what you feel most deeply. So you see, I'm, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm going a little bit longer here, Lauren, but, but we're looking, here's an entrance to scripture, a different world than trying to control and manage and, and, and be perfect. So here's the entrance. Once in, the Lord invites us to speak from our hearts and and what do you often find with, with eating problems? You find that there has been rejection. You find that there has been hard things in a person's past. And, and what does it mean to, to, to come to a God who knows those things? And, and he says that you can trust me. I will make things right. I will be the one to make things right. Um, the, the day will come when things are right. So he says that. But the other thing he says is, is that if people have done things to us that have been truly sinful and wicked, it's, we call it's shame. That's what it is. It's, it's I, I, you, you believe what has been done against you. You have been treated in a disgusting way, so you believe you're disgusting. And, and in the midst of that, Here's, well, what does the Lord do? He, he goes into shame himself and, and finds us, takes our shame on himself. He, he takes our guilt and our shame, and somehow he puts us to death, even in his own life. And, and then he says, I'm thinking of a um, passage in Isaiah. Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll use a psalm. This is Psalm 56, I think. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame, which is another way of saying that here he is, here, here the Lord is doing something very different again, uh, where he, he takes our shame from us. He, he comes into a union with us that, that is 
that is described as marriage. That's one of the prominent images in scripture. And he says, he says, like in marriage, you, you inherit the debts of the person and you inherit the reputation of the person. Uh, a spouse participates in the reputation of their spouse. And, and we now are joined not to the person who committed the wickedness. We are now been yanked, we've been detached from that person because of Christ. And now we are connected to the king himself who has all things and and we have been elevated with great honor. I'm just giving you little tastes of these things. Excuse me for going on and on. But what I'm trying to do is say, here's anorexia, here are eating disorders, and the Bible doesn't talk about it. It talks about moderation and things like that. But that doesn't seem to go very deep. What we're trying to do is just saying, here's, here's a few little corridors we find as we enter into God's house. And they're just some of them. The, cri the criteria for those corridors is they have to sound really good. <laughs> if it's not biblical care, if it sounds judging and uh, condemning. Absolutely. It, yes. it's, it's, it's called good news. And, and so, uh, frankly, even, even, if, even if the Spirit is identifying our sins, that's really good news. Because, because sins unattended to, they, they lead us away from the Lord, and there's just no life there. So anyway, excuse me for going on and on on just that one particular point, yeah. but it's, it is an illustration of how the, the question, how does scripture speak to all these different layers that somebody can have in their own lives? Um, these articles try to put together a bit of a map for somebody who's struggling with it. And, and it's hopefully, we, we, it, it seems to be a hopeful map in, in most of these articles. So Yeah, that's wonderful. And it seems like, so as you say, the Bible doesn't talk about the word anorexia or the word bipolar or the word gender dysphoria or anything along those lines that are common today that a lot more people are dealing with. But the root, it almost sounds, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're suggesting that scripture deals with the core issues that underlie all of those things. And it's a matter of using you know, what scripture says and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of somebody who knows scripture well, who's in agreement with you to figure yeah. out where's the core issue that scripture speaks to that you're dealing with so that he can set you free. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and what you oftentimes find is, is so many of our struggles, they go to like what you're saying, sort of a common core of, of guilt, of shame, of, of fear, of anger, of addiction, you know, being, being ensnared by something that used to be your friend and used to be life to you, um, and and victimization um, and rejection. You know those those six or so are, are spoken. I can't say they're they're spoken on every page of scripture, but they're spoken everywhere in scripture, and those tend to be the substrate for for so many of the modern problems that we experience. Absolutely, that makes sense. So. If like, let's say somebody who's in ministry, leadership, pastors, whatever, if they get a hold of the Life Council Bible, is this something that you foresee or the hope was they would be able to use as a tool for helping the people that come to them for counseling, for biblical or pastoral care, however you phrase it? I, I what, what I would hope, and this has happened a few times for me, uh, that we're reading the Bible and one of these articles appear. Uh, if I, we, my wife and I were reading Romans 1, and then there was this wonderful article on homosexuality and sexual struggles. Um, um, and so we read the article, uh, and and what do we do? This is this is fascinating. So the next time our family's together, we talk about that article. You 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 hear about it and you want to pass it along. You want to pass the word to to others. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I've seen in my own life. It's sort of contagious. When when scripture really settles in and goes to the heart, like you're saying, and it it speaks powerfully to some of the issues of life, we can't we don't want to contain it. We we, we want to talk about it. So that's that's certainly one of the things. So for a pastor, it might mean you're reading this Bible and here's this article. I got to I got to get this to this other person. They're going to love this. They're going to love it. Or just a friend, you know, hey, this is this has been good for my own soul. I just want to I photocopied this and here, here's 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 a couple of pages. Take a look at it. Um, that's that's what we want. It, it's 
it's not that the Bible, that that particular, what we're doing in the Life Council Bible is, it, 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 so somebody has a, doesn't have to get that particular Bible, but the concept behind it, how can we access scripture? So it speaks. So it's like this treasure chest that speaks to all of life. That's that's a critical question. And the Life Council Bible tries to be a, an asset to the church in answering the question. One of those tools that helps people to recognize that the answers to even all of the modern issues is still addressed in scripture if you approach it with that expectation. And sometimes we need help. And sometimes I need help to, <laughs> to answer that question. What is it that God says to this? Yeah. So. so what have I not asked you that you want to make sure you leave with our audience? That's a that's a nasty question to ask, Lauren, because you can tell I, I started riffing on, <laughs> on eating things. So you better not ask me. You better not open up anything. I I um I've had this enviable job. You've had an enviable job too, granted. Um, but the envy of my job is is for decades. It's been what are the struggles of human life? What are they like? Uh, to understand them and then to make that bridge. What is it that God says? Um, and, and to see the Lord who cares for the details of our life, to see how in his word he speaks so profoundly and so lovingly and gently, inevitably gently to, to those particular issues. To see that... Um, in scripture, that's, to me, that that's an enviable job. And, and this Bible is just sort of just bringing other people into, into the beauty of that kind of work. Um, that scripture, I, I think I mentioned before, scripture is much more of a treasure chest than we, we anticipate. There's a lot more beautiful things and there's more to come. Yeah, absolutely. I hear that. So where can people go to learn more about you? Uh, I believe most of my work hangs out on ccef.org. Um, uh, if they want to know more about me, I guess there's a little bit in there, but there's not that much exciting to know. But there's a lot of there's a lot of great articles in there that that are from myself and my colleagues over the years. So ccf.org would be would be the place for me. Uh, the Life Council Bible itself. I got one for free, so I didn't. I didn't have to. I didn't have to go on the web. I didn't have to go somewhere to find it. So I can't tell you where to find it. I haven't looked it up. I'll online. find it. I will find it, and I will link to that in the show notes and the ccf.org. So, okay, good. Uh, thank you so much, Ed. This has been very insightful. I really appreciate your time. Like a good way to spend some time in the day, isn't it? Yes. Thanks. For sure. Thank you. Are you looking for a holistically minded healthcare practitioner who truly treats root cause rather than symptom suppression? Unfortunately, even in the alternative healing professions, this isn't a given. That's why I've created wholehealthdoctor.com, a resource to help connect patients to healthcare practitioners in their area who share a root cause philosophy. Alternatively, most of the practitioners listed also practice telehealth. So if there isn't anyone local to you, you can still find a great practitioner to help you regain optimal health. Go to wholehealthdoctor.com. That's whole healthdr.com, type in your location or adjust the specialty that you're looking for and find the practitioner who's right for you.